Could you start recording, please? So this is a class on women's Zen ancestors, and it's not just Zen, it also goes back to uh, the time of the Buddha. And I think the, the real overview here is that women have always been present in Buddhist communities. And they have always been present as serious practitioners. And they have, even from the time of the Buddha, they have been present as teachers. And this is something that, you know, we, we it's not as widely known as it should be. When you read the early books in English on um, women in Buddhism, they're all kind of shocked that, my God, there were women there. And uh, in early Western practice, you know, Americans would go around saying, oh, we're so great because we have women in our sanghas and completely ignoring that there were these powerful, fantastic, completely 100% women sanghas for thousands of years in East Asia, you know, and South Asia. And, you know, it's like this kind of, I don't know, small mind uh, and arrogance, Western arrogance is what it is. Um, I want to quote from an art historian, uh, Chiyun Lillian Kwan. And uh, I can't remember how I fell upon this article, but it's absolutely wonderful. It's called, the article is called Nuns, Donors, and Sinners, Images of Women in Goryeo Buddhist Paintings. So that's the medieval Goryeo times in Korea. Um, and what's wonderful about it is, you know, instead of reading like the sort of intellectual literature, she looks at the physical documents, the, 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 the pictures, the paintings, and the, you know, temple sculptures, and all of that kind of stuff. And she says this, extant woodblock prints and silk paintings often depict women as recipients, practitioners, and patrons of the Buddhist faith. They appear in the form of taking the tonsure, mingling with monks or nuns, commissioning Buddhist images, or receiving punishment in the underworld after death. Whether on woodblock print or in fine color on silk, images of women are shown with equal prominence as participants in the support and practice of Buddhism and as subjects to karmic, as subject to judgment in the underworld bureaucracy under similar conditions as the men. This is the 10 kings. You go before the 10 kings and they decide what happens to you. Um, karmic reward and retribution is portrayed in a perfect meritocracy regardless of gender, whether it be accumulating good karma by offering donations or receiving punishment for past wrongdoings. Rebirth in the six paths also neither emphasizes one sex over the other as the two possible gender forms appear with equal consistency and you could have gone from one gender to another in one life to another. As such, images of the Goryeo Sangha and Goryeo Buddhist paintings allocate equal emphasis on both the male and the female, possibly reflecting the Goryeo society as described in the text. What is remarkable, however, is that while the Buddhist Sangha may be represented by both sexes, they are ultimately framed within a system governed by patriarchy. That says it all. And I love that it's an art historian who wrote that. You know, somebody who actually looks at what's in front of them instead of theorizing about, you know, stuff. I think that's really great. So um, you all read this, but I'll recapitulate. The bad news is that uh, the, from the time of the Buddha, there were more strictures on women than there were on men. There were the eight rules. Um, they were, it was more difficult for women to access practice. Um, women had to sit behind men in assemblies. Um, women had to take women who were going to be, um, women who were going to uh, um, uh, going to uh, take, uh, become monastics had to have permission of both men and women to do so and so on and so forth. So that's all written in here. I do want to read the eight rules that they're very important. A nun must give homage to a, mar a monk no matter how new he is or experienced he is. So you could be a nun for 50 years and a new monk you have to do a full prostration to. 
During the rainy season, a nun cannot, during rainy season retreat, a nun cannot stay where there is no monk. So this is a stricture on the independence of women's communities. Every two weeks, a nun needs to ask the monks about important ceremonial dates so that the monks had sort of a stranglehold on how things happened. Nuns had to make confession before both monks and nuns, but monks never make confession before nuns. A nun who has committed an offense must be disciplined by both orders. Again, monks were only disciplined by monks. A nun who has um, nun ordination is received from both orders, which had very severe consequences. We'll talk about that later. Nuns can insult or ridicule a monk, and nuns cannot correct monks, but monks can correct nuns, which makes it very happy, very difficult rather, for um, the community, a, a community of both men and women to work together because the nun can't say, I'm sorry, you're wrong, <laughs> you know? So that doesn't work so well. But the good news is that some Buddhist sutras were supportive of women, and we'll talk about that in a minute. The Sangha is always presented as the fourfold Sangha, monks, nuns, laymen, laywomen, in that order. But laymen were present at the start, they were important as the start, they were, uh, they were actually teachers, um, they were uh, important benefactors. Um, women's institutions could be, not only could be strong and vital, but at various times they were stronger and more vital than the men's. Um, and sometimes these rules work to make the women's orders more independent um, in some senses. And of course, there's this basic Buddhist document that all beings inherently have Buddha nature. So um, the handout gives examples of the early nuns and I really recommend The First Buddhist Women by Susan Murcott. There are several um, compilations or editions of translations of the uh, poems by the early nuns in the time of the Buddha, but this one also, this was the first one in English, I believe, but it also gives their biographies. So it's a good source. And many of these were major teachers in their own right, and they were clearly seen as individuals. Of course, uh, Nanda had to ask Buddha three times. Well, first, Mahapajapati, uh, his uh, stepmother, had to ask him three times whether women could be nuns, and he said, no, 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 no. And so she left, walked for 150 miles back with a retinue of women again asking to be nuns, and this time Ananda interceded, and Buddha again said, no, 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 no. But finally, Ananda said, look, can't women wake up? And he said, well, of course, all beings can wake up. And Ananda said, well? And then Buddha said, okay, this practice would have lasted for a thousand years because women are going to be practitioners. It'll only last for 500. And he said that over 2,600 years ago. So clearly he didn't know what he was talking about, if he was talking about that. And we'll get to that in the chat because some people had questions about that. In the Mahayana canon, um, there's a lot of women in the Mahayana canon, not in every sutra. Like the Diamond Sutra is very austere. The only people who speak are, are, are male. Um, but, um, and Buddhism after patriarchy, which I have on my shelf, but I didn't bring here to show you. Um, that's a wonderful source for uh, women in the, in the Mahayana Sutras. Um, the Avatamsaka Sutra is very interesting. Um, there are many female beings in there in the last chapter, which is a hundred page chapter of Sudana making a pilgrimage to learn wisdom. And he meets with a number of female mendicants, lay women, nuns, goddesses, night goddesses, male monks, mendicants, um, laymen, bodhisattvas, and etc. And many of these are women, female mendicants, lay women, nuns, goddesses, night goddesses. These are all female. And there's even a prostitute, Vasumutra. The Koreans call her pass a million. Um, you sleep with her once and you lose all desire and you wake up, which makes you wonder why men went to her, but they did. I guess it's a, easier than becoming a, a monk. You know, you just sleep with this woman and you wake up. Um, there's very few discussions of gender, but the Vimalakirti Sutra has a, a really long one, which is fantastic, and I'll summarize them. Basically, this Devankaya appears. So Vimalakirti, all these Buddhas and Bodhisattvas, a room about the size of my office, and there are thousands of beings because it's a magical Mahayana Sutra. Um, appear and 
um, Shariputra is very fretful and, and sort of annoyed during this whole sutra. And he runs into this uh, Devankaya, uh, this female being, and um, she clearly seems to be very awake. And he basically says, well, you know, how did you get that way? And she goes on this whole thing of not male, not female, you know, gender doesn't exist. And Shariputra just, he doesn't believe any of it and he keeps questioning her. And so finally, boom, she becomes male and he becomes female. And he completely freaks out, just totally freaks out. And um, so uh, she says, all things are ne neither male, ne ne are neither male nor female, and then switches him back and he learns his lesson. And the interesting thing about this chapter is that it tells us a lot about the Mahayana attitude towards women. Um, her, the Devankaya's analysis of gender is not that men and women are equal, but that gender does not exist. That's her analysis. And this is a double-edged sword because you can evoke it to liberate women. Gender does not exist, therefore there's no, nothing to stop you. you know, your gender should not stop you. On the other hand, it's a lame excuse to perpetuate a misogynistic status. Gender doesn't exist. What are you complaining about? You know, right? Um, and the other interesting thing about that is that um, she's not given a name. She's this really powerful awakened being, and she isn't named. And this is a big theme um, that um, women often in these stories, they're obviously outsmart the men, and they're not named. This just happens over and over and over again. Um, women do appear in the lineage chart, and Moshan is the uh, most important. She was really con considered an equal to anyone. Um, there were written, written records of the women teachers, just as there were written re records of the men's teachers, but they were preserved in the women's monasteries, and so they were kind of lost. The way I, I describe it is like the women's records went into specialized libraries, whereas the men's records became bestsellers. But it's not like they didn't exist. They're there and starting in the 1990s, um, scholars in both Asia and uh, the West um, started unpacking them, you know, finding them and translating them and unpacking them and analyzing them. And, and so we, we have quite a few of them. Um, Let's see, what else do I want to say? Um, I don't want to get into particulars. You can ask questions about some of the very particular women. Um, you know, they're here. People who see the video can go to our webpage and find this and then read it. Um, I do want to talk about one, however, and this is uh, Rionan Genso, who was uh, Japanese. And the reason I want to talk about it is that I personally connected with her in the following way. So she was in the 17th century. Um, she led a courtly life. A lot of these women were rich, otherwise they could not have even dreamed of practicing Zen. Um, that she led a courtly life and um, wanted admittance into the monastery because she just couldn't, as a lay person, she couldn't practice as, as hard as she wanted to. And she was refused admission because she was gorgeous. And so she picks up this hot iron, she presses it against her face and then takes it away and says, will you admit me now? And yes, she was admitted. Um, and the connection is that she was also a great calligrapher. And I actually saw a calligraphy in which she wrote about this experience. And I'll read her poem. Formerly to amuse myself with court, I would burn orchid incense. Now to enter the Zen life, I burn my own face. The four seasons pass by naturally like this, but I don't know who I am amidst the change. In this living world, the body I give up and burn would be wretched if I thought of myself as anything but firewood. And I stood in front of that. And you know, it's like you read about these people, but again, it's, it's this physical evidence. This woman was real. She existed and she did this and she wrote about it. And if there hadn't been a guard standing there, I could have reached out 
and touched what she had touched. And that was like, oh my God, <laughs> it was such a moment, you know, to see that. Um, very quickly for Korea, because we're a Korean uh, lineage, um, Korea in the Goryeo period, this was a tremendous flowering. Uh, they had many women queens. Um, there was even a woman general, I believe. Um, and uh, women were encouraged in their monastic practice. The, and this was true in China as well. At certain times within the court, you'd have a sort of a, a women's temple within the court where women would take vows and live like nuns, but they'd be rich people too and stay in the court. I don't know quite how that worked, but um, anyway, so, so that was a, a great flowering. And, um, and then in the early Choson, the Confucians became ascend ascendant. And this lasted for many hundreds of years in Korea for like about eight or 900 years. I'm sorry, four or 500 years. Um, and they basically decimated the monastic community, both men and women. But somehow they managed to survive. And in fact, the fact that the community was decimated made the nuns even stronger because they really had to rely on each other. There was no monks community that they could go to, no bureaucracy that they could go to. So they remained very strong. Um, towards the end of this period in the early, um, late 19th, early 20th century, the great reformer Kyung Ho appeared and he's one of our ancestors. He's our great, great grandfather, um, great, great, great grandfather. And um, he actually had communities like Zen Master Sung San set up where lay people and monastics lived together in community. Um, he, he did that. Um, but then the Japanese came in charge and they did their own form of death. So Kyungho really built up Buddhism in Korea again. And then the Japanese came in and they tried to make it Japanese. So they, you know, um, tried to get rid of nuns. They made the monks marry and so on and so forth. And it was a very difficult period um, in Korean Buddhism. And then um, after the Japanese were gotten rid of, um, the Chogi order, the dominant order, decided to go back to celibacy. And this was a tremendous fight. And because the nuns were had never married, they actually were leaders in this, um, in this uh, attempt to go back to the standard monastic forms because they were unsullied by it. They had kept their, the, the classical forms. And so they were, they were leaders in this. Um, although you'll never hear their names. Uh, the training for a nun is extremely rigorous, just as the training for a monk is extremely rigorous. And um, we can, women were given transmission in 20th century Korea. Um, this is not that well known, but they were. And uh, some of us, I know Wenda, and I guess it's just Wenda and Stan and I on the screen who have uh, gone to Korea and seen some of these women's temples. And we know what that's like and we know how vibrant they are and how wonderful they are. Um, so that's kind of my quick, quick summary. And, um, And uh, if people could be visible on screen, it really helps me to see your faces. So there are a couple of people who've stopped their video and it really helps me if I can uh, see people. So let's see, okay. So what interests me in your questions is that you point to some really uncomfortable stuff and what people are largely pointing to, and if you haven't entered questions or, or comments, uh, you still can do that because I'm gonna scroll through and so what you write will appear. Um, this is, this really gets to the heart, the very first comment gets to the heart of, um, of uh, what, what people were, um, were sort of bothered by. 
and this is someone who went on to read the Lives of the Nuns, which is in the um, in the bibliography at the end of, of my my piece. Um, it says some of the nuns carried out suicide by fire as part of their practice. The text seems to suggest this practice has roots in the culture of China and not part of the Buddhist tradition. The tradition has shifted since the nuns lived their lives to suicide by fire as protest. Is this part of the Korean Zen tradition? Do you know the story behind suicide by fire as a Buddhist tradition? What are your thoughts on this tradition in today's culture? There are a few references to chanting as a form of practice. Footnote says, specialize in chanting the scriptures quickly. Speed chanting, a mark of singularity. This is about particular nuns written in the lives of the nuns, which is what, 11th, 10th, 12th, 13th century, something like that. Um, what, is a, uh, what is a mark of singularity in reference to speed chanting? This seems similar to Zen Master Sun Sun saying he chants the great Jirani while doing prostrations, bows, and he perceives the chant. General question, what is your opinion as to whether or not the Buddha actually said women could not be ordained, then changed his mind and said yes. Wow, that's a lot. Um, I wanna thank this person who had to leave because her sound was having problems and so she left. Um, so this, if, this thing about self-mutilation is very interesting and um, I don't believe it still happens but it certainly happened through the mid 20th century. And it was monks and nuns. And you showed your devotion. One of the ways you showed your devotion was by putting your finger in a fire and letting like a knuckle or two knuckles or all of your finger burn off. And people would do that in um, like to uh, repent. And people would do that to um, gain merit for some relative who had died and people would do that to show the sincerity of their practice. And when there was one of the Korea trips and I can't, I, maybe it was Naksansa, I'm not sure. There was some temple in Korea which had a fabulous history. It was a nun's temple and then maybe it was a monk's temple first, but during the, the Korean war it was completely destroyed. And some nuns came in and they completely rebuilt it with their hands, you know. I mean, really, they did the work. They lifted the stones, they carved the wood, they did everything themselves. And then the monks came and said, oh, thank you, we'll take our temple now. And they fought it and they went to the hierarchy. They said, we built this thing. These guys can't have it back. And the hierarchy actually agreed with them. And these women, they do like one year kill chase. They don't do three month retreats twice a year. They do Kelche for an entire year, or maybe it's three years. I don't remember. It's this long period of time that they're in intensive retreat, three years. Okay. And um, can you imagine going and sitting in a retreat for three years, you know? And so they practiced, man, they practice hard. And some of the old women, so we, we visited them. It was actually during a retreat. So we were but we were allowed, those of us who were teachers were allowed to speak to some of the senior nuns and then um, the other people were allowed to sort of wander the grounds, which are of course beautiful. It's in a mountain, it's really amazing. Um, and some of the senior nuns, they were missing knuckles. And they were missing knuckles. These were women, this would have been like about 10, 20 years ago. And these women were, were like in their 80s or 90s. So they were, you know, um, but, and this was from this thing of putting your finger in a fire and burning off a part of a part or all of your finger in order to show your devotion. Um, so yeah, it's a real thing. And um, I don't know anyone who's done it. And, you know, it's interesting if you ask to say like, what do I think about that? It's not for me to think about that. When you meet people like that, you have to acknowledge their strength and their experience, which doesn't mean that you would want yourself to do it or your best friend to do it or anyone else to do it, but to actually acknowledge they saw the world a certain way 
and the way they saw the world, they did this then. And um, there's a wonderful, um, an amazing monk, he lived to be like 120 or something, Shun Yun, X-U-N, Y-U-N. Um, and he has an autobiography, it's a, a, as told to autobiography. He didn't write it, he told it to someone who wrote it. Um, and um, he talks about this, he did this several times. You know, just, there was some, he was practicing really hard and he had this, this strong, impulse that this was something he needed to do and he did it and it wasn't like i need to do this it wasn't like about i it was more like this is the thing that must be done and he did it and i wouldn't do it that's me you know our minds have to be very wide um so yeah it's a practice and it's a practice that to us sounds yucky just like the ancient chan masters you know picking up their zen sticks and whacking their students I mean, you do this now, you go to jail, right? You know, hopefully. Um, but that's what they did. They did that. They even whacked him on the head, you know? We say, what, concussion, are you crazy? But they would do that. They'd whack each other on the head, you know? I don't know. You know, it's like this world is really vast and wide. And um, I have to acknowledge the depth of their practice experience without necessarily approving of what they did. It's not for me to approve or disapprove, you know? It's that's who they were. That's what they did. We do with that what they wish. Well, I mean, what we wish. We do with that what we wish. They did what they did. That's it, you know, uh, different times, different places. Um, and then I want to talk about the chanting. So one of the ways um, that monastics would support themselves and their monasteries is by chanting. They would do chanting ceremonies for people. They would chant for, um, uh, you know, dead people. That was a big deal. Uh, they would chant for sick people. Um, you know, in um, it's like uh, Buddhism is the in in Japan. Buddhism is the religion of death, and Shinto is the religion of uh, celebration. So you get married in a Shinto temple, and you have a Buddhist funeral. So. Uh, so yeah, chanting, you know, people, uh, monks and nuns would chant to, you know, bring about good fortune, you know, get rid of drought, whatever. They'd be pulled in to chant for people. And that's how they earn money. So yeah, so I don't know what speed chanting. I don't think in this, the lives of the nuns, um, she would be chanting out loud, whereas Zen Master Sung Son was doing a very fast mantra practice in his head without chanting out loud. So it's a, it's a different thing. I don't know what a mark of singularity in reference to speed chanting means, but it's important to understand that, um, that yes, uh, chanting was very important. This is how people earned their, earned their living and supported their monastery. Um, and then what's my opinion as to whether the Buddha actually said women could not be ordained and changed his mind and said, yes, I have no idea. I wasn't there, you know? We have these stories, we just have absolutely no idea. So thank you to the person who wrote that comment. It was, it was a great way to start off and um, it got to a lot of important things. The history of women in Zen parallels the history of women in other walks of life. Indeed it does, right? Yeah, absolutely. Okay, here's a question. Who could become a Buddhist nun? It seemed like this changed over time and across regions. But I ask because unlike early Christianity, it seems at least in early Buddhism, both rich and poor women could become nuns, not just women for aristocratic families. This is a wonderful question. Um, anyone could become a nun. There was never any um, insistence that you know you had to endow a chair in the meditation hall in order to enter the, the convent. Um, but it's true that it was more difficult for poor people in general. Um, in, in some sense, it was easier because if you're really super, super poor, then entering the, the, the temple, becoming monastic gave you, gave you a way to survive, but how you could free yourself from your family obligations, it was more difficult. Whereas in upper-class families, um, the, it was easier to free yourself from your obligations 
you know, your husband died, you could give your kids to your sister and then you could go off. Um, but it, what is true is that the women that we hear about largely, not always, but largely tend to come from the upper classes. And this is because they were the ones who had access to education. So you could enter, enter a nun's temple or a monk's temple, but if you were very poor, you might never hit the meditation hall. You might be relegated to the kitchen for the whole time that you were there. So the people we hear about are the people who had access to education. And there is where the class difference really comes in. Um, so Judy? Yeah. So even within the temple then, that class difference was still maintained? It depends on the temple. Okay, some temples it would be, some temples it wouldn't be. Yeah. And in some of the smaller temples, um, the um, the young nuns would be basically servants to the older ones. So, yeah. Um, and the um, the story of uh, the 20th century Korean nun, um, Song Yang, is like that. She entered the temple as a small child, and she was basically a servant, and she wanted to practice so hard that finally she was given permission to practice with Mon Gong, and she became a very great leader of, of um, in Korean Buddhism. Um, okay, I was surprised by the gender distinction in such a spiritual practice, and at the same time, not surprised. This is the story of women throughout history. Yes, the fact that women were still present in big numbers is great. It is just a matter of going through the historical texts and finding out more. Yes, it is. The important role of women as mythic figures in the texts and sutras, etc., is remarkable. I enjoyed it. There is simply a difference between the Dharma, the teaching, and the practice in temples. Thank you. <laughs> that says it. <laughs> okay. Um, the special rules. Do you have an opinion as to whether you believe the Buddha did say no then yes? Well, I don't know. Like I say, I don't know. I think the special rules, whether they come from the Buddha or they come after the Buddha, they came very early. That's very clear. They came extremely early. Probably they came from the very beginning because the reason that he apocryphally said that Buddhism will last, well, not Buddhism, this practice will last for a thousand years, but he admit women will last for 500, is because he was expecting social um, objection, objection from society to having women mendicants. Because there were lots of men mendicants at that time, there were no women mendicants. So he was expecting a backlash. And so the special rules, in a sense, were, were um, telling the society at large, we're not being that revolutionary. We're keeping women down. We're keeping them in their place. You know, we're, we're, uh, don't worry about us. We're not going to cause any problems here. Our women are just as subservient as if they weren't none. So it's okay. That's basically the function of the special rules. Um, so yeah, I, pro I believe that they probably were not added later that they came there from the beginning. Um, the story of Ronan Genso, the self-mutilation seems severe and severe to think of self as anything but firewood. But if I could understand the death of these nuns' dedication, probably I wouldn't be watching Netflix or planning trips to see my three-year-old granddaughter. <laughs> um, she, this person read in Stephen Addis more about Ronan, how much she did, and her art and scholarship and teaching, and her poem when she knew of coming death. And here's the poem, in the autumn of my 66th year, and this person is 64, I've already lived a long time. The intense moonlight is bright upon my face. There's no need to discuss the principle of koan study. Just listen carefully to the wind outside the pines and cedars. So that's, I guess, kind of, yeah, so the, the, the death poems, uh, this is interesting. Um, it's an interesting genre. Some of these people wrote down their death poems years and years and years before they died, and they put it in this place, special place. And then when they were about to die, they say, "Oh, find my death poem. I just wrote it an hour ago." <laughs> you know, like that. Uh, so it's kind of interesting, but yeah, thank you, thank you. Um, and someone is inspired. And then, uh, so I had this metaphor of green frogs in the paper 
on, on the metaphor is that I was doing a solo retreat early in my practice at Providence Zen Center and they had a little hermitage, a little cabin. Now it's much nicer, but back then it was off in the woods and it was just really decrepit, but it was great. Um, and every day I'd walk to the pond and I knew that there were frogs in the pond. I could hear the frogs in the pond. I could never see the frogs in the pond because they were expecting these sort of brownish greenish things, you know, sort of, sort of sitting on a, a log or a rock. I was expecting to see that. And like the, a day or two before I left, I looked down into the water and there were all these green frogs stretched out under the water. I'd just been looking in the wrong place. And that's kind of how the history of women in Buddhism has been. Everyone was looking in the wrong place, you know, and there they are. They've been there the whole time. Yeah. And, uh, and then this person writes, yes, the mind directs and affects our understanding of the world. And then someone noticed that in the Middle Ages Europe, women only had power and they were allowed to own property. That's a very interesting statement. I don't know what kind of ownership of property women had in, um, in uh, you know, sort of uh, pre-19th or 20th century East Asia. I have no idea. So that's a really interesting question um, or comment. Okay, and then someone wrote this thing that struck me. Women were seen as strong practitioners, but I wonder how much they had to be strong in that they essentially had less room for error. That's a great comment. I mean, that's the thing about you have to, a woman has to be twice as good as a man in order to get half the salary. That's, yeah, that's a really good comment. And I would add not only less room for error, but in order to be even admitted to practice and admitted to the sangha, the monastic sangha. The nun Rion and Genso, who was ordered to burning her face, boy, she really hit a lot of people. Just to be accepted is amazing and inspiring, but also terribly upsetting. Upsetting. Because of her physicality, she had to resort to this merely to be taken seriously. Um, I'm lucky enough not to be beautiful enough to ever have to deal with this. But, you know, if you're really gorgeous, I think it's a huge problem. You know, re really, really beautiful women, you know, movie star types who are absolutely gorgeous. I think it's a huge problem. Um, yeah, I'll give you a little anecdote. Our granddaughter has bright red hair. It's gorgeous. Everyone sees her red hair. That's all they see is her red hair. And when she was four years old, she said, people like me because I have red hair. And my heart just broke. <laughs> you know, if you carry that, you know, you carry this gorgeous physicality with you and you know that that's all people see. That's, yeah, that's interesting. I don't know if gorgeous men have to do it. We have two guys here. Do gorgeous men have to deal with this? <laughs> okay. <laughs> all right. Um, related to this, I'm again amazed and inspired by how strong these women were and how strong they were able to get away with being. That's a good point. They're not only strong, but they got away with it, especially in some of their at interactions, like um, Moshan. Um, I'm not a fox spirit. Why should I transform myself? That's when somebody challenges her on being a woman. And, and you know, when Moshan, so the story where this this monk who really doesn't think Moshan belongs in the guest quarters of the temple. Um, oh no, that's Miao Tsung, never mind. And so Miao Tsung, um, she's an upper class woman. She's a serious practitioner. She's in the guest quarters of the temple because she's so serious and she's practicing with the monks and and this the, the head monk can't stand it. So he goes for an interview and he's gonna have a Dharma interview with her to, you know, really and so she says oh wait a minute and he comes in and she's lying down stark naked you know face up everything's showing and she um he says he he points to her vagina and says something like what comes from here and she says all buddhas and bodhisattvas come from this place and he says well can i come in and she says horses may cross asses may not cross this interview is over, <laughs> you know, whoa, that is really something. Okay, so how many other women are there who were this outspoken for whom it wasn't well received? That's a really good question. How many women tried this? You know, were strong, not tried it, they were strong and they were slapped down. We don't know. So that's a wonderful question. Also, how many women were outspoken and it simply wasn't recorded? We don't know that either. 
how do we know this isn't merely hagiographical and that these women were really able to be forthcoming and strong in their interactions? I have no idea. I like to believe these stories are true. You know, they're so, they're so unusual that I think they kind of have to be true. I don't think you could make this stuff up. But maybe you could. I don't know. Um, and then Kim Iriop's book, Reflections of a Zen, Zen Buddhist Nun, is still available, albeit for around $50. I have to tell you, it is, um, I read that, I was supposed to review that book and I decided not to review it um, because it's basically written for lay people and it's kind of condescending. So she's basically popularizing Buddhism for lay people that she doesn't expect to practice very hard, which considering her history that she was a very prominent feminist uh, believer in free love, you know, publicly would declare, I believe in free love um, in 1920s Korea. What? Are you kidding? And then um, becomes like this very austere Buddhist nun. And it's like, it was very strange. So they're, they're, they're kind of pop things. But yeah, if you want to read it, you can read it. Um, I think I would suggest instead Martine Batchelor's book, um, Women in Korean Buddhism, which has a terrible title because it sounds sociological, but it's her practice as a Westerner in um, um, Kusan Sunim's temple, and then the As Told To autobiography of the nun Sung Yang. That gives you a much better sense of um, what it was like in early 20th uh, century Korea. I admit in reading these notes in the past, the unordinary life of Kim Uriya stood out. Her last 10 years of life remained in menopause, meditation posture, more or less continuously. She had to pee, right? Not even lying down to sleep, atrophied legs so she could no longer walk. Maybe not a horrible reason for the changes with aging. Would like have to read more how her first practice benefited others. That's a really qu good question about how these fierce practices that people had, how do they benefit others? Um, and let's hold that question. And when I'm done going through these, we could, um, which I guess I'm almost done, um, we could maybe talk about that. How does fierce practice benefit others if it does? Um, and then let's see, I guess what both strikes me and then sadly doesn't surprise me is that socio-cultural variables, gender, still found ways to subjugate fed women, indeed they did. I guess in my head, seeing through delusions would have included seeing beyond this fallacy. Wouldn't you think so? <laughs> it doesn't. Okay. Uh, can you read the title of which article again? I'm not sure. Um, the, the, is this the article on the... Um, it was the woodblock one, I think. Okay, well, the, the person who wrote this actually had, had to leave. No, wait, she's still here. So can you, uh, t can you speak out and tell us what article you wanted the title of? It was the first article you quoted um, <laughs> about the artist who read the... Uh... It was in the handout. Oh, okay, okay, thank you. Great. All right. Um, Okay, let's see. Legs atrophied so couldn't walk, not aspirational for me. In Buddhist story, he rejected extreme asceticism. Atrophied legs held up as a model. That's a terrifically wonderful, deep comment. Yeah, so Buddha turned his back on this kind of intense practice, or did he? Okay. What he turned his back on was a severe asceticism, but then he did have this practice under the Bodhi tree for six days or six years, depending on which story you hear. And if it's the six years, that's pretty ascetic. So this is, this will go into the discussion we're going to have on the, the functionality or not of, um, of, uh, you know, this intense practice. So last comment before we get to a group discussion. Do you feel that the omission of women's names in the different stories was intentional? In my head, it makes me think it was purposeful to continue the patriarchal system. What do you think? I think so, yeah. But, you know, I don't think it was intentional in the sense of <laughs> I don't think it's that kind of intentionality. I think it's more like these people don't count, so we don't have to talk about them. You know, it's like anytime, like 
there's so many groups that society looks down on. And when you're in one of those groups and you speak and nobody hears you, you know, we actually had an experience the other day in the American Zen Teachers Association meeting, for God's sake, which I'm going to be back in in less than an hour, um, where a woman said something and it was ignored. And then the man said the same thing like 10 minutes later and people reacted to it. And I'm like, you know, I, I went in the chat box and I privately wrote, did this just happen? You know, <laughs> like, what? So, yeah. So I think the deal is if you're, you know, whatever that group is and people just don't hear you, they don't see you, you're like invisible. And so it's not like they're trying to put you down. You're already so put down that they don't even see you. I think that that's what's going on. And that's why, you know, the records of the women, with few exceptions, the records of the women are records of the women teaching women. There are exceptions, but um, largely that's, it's the women continuing the tradition of other women. Um, yeah. And um, I was reading uh, Grace Shireson's book, uh, Zen Women, the other day. And she talks about how, um, Hakuin and Dogen, who were very um, um, very supportive of women's practice, including women's intense practice, um, but they would very deliberately bring up examples of great women to their women students. And like Hakuin might give a koan to a woman student that was based on some other woman's experience as a way of encouraging them. Although I can tell you as a, that this can backfire. I remember when I was in graduate school in mathematics and there was a major theorem that was proved by somebody whose name, it was, it was Russian and it was a name that was, um, that was, um, uh, we didn't know the gender of it. And a woman professor said, maybe a woman proved this theorem. And I remember feeling like, you know, like there's this pressure on me, <laughs> like it, it can backfire sometimes, but yeah, right. Oh, we may want to mention the hidden lamp. Do I have the hidden lamp? The hidden lamp, yeah. So the hidden lamp is, it didn't make the bibliography because this was written, like this thing was written like about 15 years ago and this book didn't exist then. So the hidden lamp, stories from 25 centuries of awakened women, it's basically a bunch of kongons, about a hundred kongons, I think it is exactly a hundred. And then they ask women teachers to comment on that. And several teachers from our school are in there, I'm in there. Um, I uh, comment on the, the nun Shiji walking around Guji and you know saying, give me one word and he can't give her one word and then she disappears. She's one of the few women like that who is given a name. Usually they're just the tea house lady, you know, stuff like that. Um, but yeah, so it's an, it's an interesting book. And um, the Kongans all have women in them, which is interesting. Um, they're not necessarily Kongans from the classic collections, but they certainly come from the, the tradition. Um, and so, yeah, it's a, it's a good place to find stories about women. Yeah, thank you. Um, so let's open up now. Um, you can unmute yourselves if you have anything to say. And we do have this question about, um, and we can go for like maybe another 20 minutes. Um, we have this question about, um, which you may or may not want to pursue about how does, do these really austere practices, burning your finger, sitting without moving your legs, so your legs atrophy, is this helpful? Um, and then anything else you want to bring up? So just unmute yourself and start talking, and if necessary, I'll referee. Hello. <laughs> Somebody better say something. Yes. Okay. Oh, Vivian, go ahead. No, no, no. Go ahead. Go ahead. <laughs> <laughs> I was just going to say something you were talking about towards the end, Judy, that I didn't mention, but I had mentioned enough in my comment was that support of women, women supporting other women mm -hmm. that you see. And like there was that one example um, in Korea where 
the women, um, it talks about the same upper class women, including women of the royal household, were the main support for the nun Sangha. And mm -hmm. the women all kind of came together to support mm -hmm. each other. Mm -hmm. That was just something else that struck me and was, I thought it was pretty cool. Yeah, and it's pretty common too, like if you look in, in um, Christianity, who supports the convents, not the men. Yeah. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Vian, you had a... Uh... Uh, yeah, I forgot my second point. I had two points. <laughs> the first one was uh, about self-mutilation. I yeah. don't know much about religion in the world, but uh, in Christianity, I mean, in, uh, from what we know, there's a, there was also this kind of self, how do you call it, flagellation, you know, yeah. these kind right. of things. And mm -hmm. isn't it in uh, in the Philippines or in Malaysia, or whatever, there is uh, something about the Christ on the cross and they do themselves put nails in their mm -hmm. hands and uh, so this kind of thing. So I guess in any type of religious practice, severe <laughs> religious practice, there's some sort of self-mutilation something there. I mean, I, I, yeah, I don't know if it happens in every religion, but it's certainly common. Yeah. Yeah, yeah it so. certainly happens in any religion. Oh, yeah, I remember my second point. Is I've always been curious about what motivates people to, you know, to enter uh, Zen or Buddhism. I mean, at, at that time, you know, sometimes mm -hmm. you have a hint of, uh, you know, someone, a man or a woman being obsessed with this or whatever. But I always have been curious what motivated people, you know, you know. because yeah. at that time, uh, because at that time I know there was this kind of poor yeah. level of living, and it was a way, you know, just like in Christianity, it was a way. At least in Canada, when you have ten kids, you know, in the 18th century, 19th century, you had to send one of them as a priest, you know. <laughs> but beside that, beyond that, is what motivates people to? I, I'm just curious. I mean. That's, that's a really good question. And actually, once Confucianism came in, it became the opposite, where um, having a, a child enter a Buddhist monastic order was a really bad thing because the purpose of the children was to carry on the family. And you, know, you become a monk or a nun, you're not supposed to have kids. Um, so, um, but the, the question of motivation, so some of the, um, we do get some hints you know, some people were simply given as small children, like that's what happened with Song Yang. Um, and um, some of them just, you know, had like um, Miao Tsung, she would accompany her husband to listen to Zen masters, and she just listened to one and woke up. She said, whoa, <laughs> you know, I want to do this, you know, and there were all kinds of motivations. Um, Speaking of motivation to uh, become a monk or a nun, tomorrow our talk will be given. I hope she received my email. Our talk will be given by a nun who now lives in Lithuania. She's from Lithuania, but she trained for many years very hard in Korea and Hong Kong. And I asked her to talk about um, to talk about her uh, becoming a nun. I don't know if she will, but if she doesn't, please ask a question about it. Um, yeah. So, and the last thing, I'm sorry, <laughs> the last thing is uh, before, before I found out about your class, about women yeah. in Buddhism, I was reading some stories, you know, the, about Zen, about stories in martial art and uh, mm -hmm. Zen, and there's a few stories, I don't remember the title, where I was shocked and pissed at, is because women <laughs> were used as, as objects, but I don't know if it were real or just made up stories, like you there's two, but you mean yeah, yeah. yeah that, like there are two monks, the uh, a Zen master and his disciple. I don't know. They are wa walking with a lot of heavy things on their back, and they have to. I don't remember the story exactly. They have to rush to go to the temple, and the the disciple is kind of lazy. I can't. I can't. So they pass a farm, and the master goes and kisses the the girl who is working in the farm, knowing that he's going to piss off piss piss off his fa her father. And then that motivates the, the disciples to run fast because they're going to be chased by the by. <laughs> so I'm kind of surprised that abusing women at that time, you know, it's, it's kind well, of... First, this is our great-great-grandfather, Mangan. Ah. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so this kind of thing, I'm like, 
you know, it, it, it's not surprising. It's, it's history, it's history. But I mean, knowing that it is an offense, why yeah. do you do it to a woman on top of that? Knowing that, you know, this kind of thing. I've been afraid. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So from from once once you see women have as having agency and independence and deserving respect, you look at that story and you say that sucks. That was wrong behavior. Absolutely. Yeah. So um, a lot. My teacher, although he, he empowered women, he made women Zen masters, et cetera, et cetera, um, he was still a guy, you know, and he would tell these stories about hopeless women being rescued, you know, and he loved these stories. And there was this one story about a woman by the side of the road and she was wearing beautiful clothes and she had a flat tire and somehow the man had to come and rescue her. And I forget the Dharma point of the story. He always had a Dharma point that I completely forget because I was so pissed off at this story. And this period of my life is before I had a kid. So I was, I would travel all over the country to sit with him, to practice with him. And I heard this story in all these different places. And I was so pissed off at this story, just so pissed off. And I finally, in a retreat in Colorado, I raised my hand and I said, why do you tell the sexist story? And he said something which just evaded the whole thing. You know, it's not sexist, you know, what is blah, blah, blah. I forget what he said. One of these total bullshit, you know, kind of things that people do to evade the issue. Um, you know, male fragility, right? White fragility, male fragility. <laughs> I don't blame me. I'm not, you know. Uh, so anyway, and I, so I sat there, you know, after the talk, I'm sitting there and I'm just like seething. I'm just totally seething. And I just keep thinking, why is he such a sexist asshole? You know, I'm just sitting there seething, seething, seething. And as soon as the stick is hit for walking meditation, I am out of there. I mean, I am just get up there and I don't even wait my place in line to get to the door. I mean, I am out of there. I find him. He's teaching calligraphy to some guy who owns the house or his street is in and they're all like, you know, very refined doing calligraphy. And I just burst into that room. I said, why do you tell that story? You know, you may tell a story. It's a beautiful woman. I've heard the story. It's a sexist story. It's a horrible story. Why do you tell this story? You're sexist. Stop it. You know, blah, blah, blah. And he stands up and goes, I never made woman. He goes, yeah, it was a sexist story, and he shouldn't have told that story. But I was the one who was stuck on it. You know, I was the one who was stuck. I should have just said, it's a sexist story. You shouldn't tell that story, and then walked away and left him. You know, that would have been fine. But instead, I was sitting there seething, seething, seething. You know, I don't know if he learned anything. I never heard that story again. But, um, oh. <laughs> Yeah, so it's it's really interesting. Yeah, I mean these these guys, you know, these guys were as, Buddha was as full of shit as anybody. We're all full of shit, you know. And one of the wonderful things about Zen is it it encourages us to see to do better than our teachers. Like there's this thing, you know. So the the guy who did not become the sixth patriarch wrote this poem, and the sixth patriarch poem wrote this poem, which defeated the guy who did not become the sixth patriarch poem. <laughs> And then we are given a comma in which we are supposed to defeat the sixth patriarch. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I'm getting beauty from Kansas. <laughs> He's the sixth patriarch. He's got a whole book. <laughs> you know? So yeah, we should absolutely recognize these guys are full of shit and a whole lot of ways, not just gender. But that's because they're of their time. We're of our time. You know, that's just how it is. And we should be able to say you're full of shit. And then we should be able to not get caught up in that shit. You know. So yeah, that was a terrible thing Mom Gun did. It was absolutely wrong. No question about it. And you know, the woman who sends her daughter down to, you know, the monks when practicing for 10 years to check on the monk, and she sends her daughter down and I never get it because she's an old woman with a 16 year old daughter. And I think this does not make sense unless you become old when you're like 40. But anyway, um, you know, perfume and silk and everything and sends it down with this gift of clothing and bedding and everything to make this monk's life and the permanent happier. And she goes down there and, you know, and then the, the thing is, she tells her daughter, really hard and see what he does. So she, the daughter grabs him and kisses him and says, how do you feel now? Now, 
if you had a 16 year old daughter, would you send her down <laughs> with the homeless guy and the bottom of the hill that you begin food to and then ask, how do you feel? <laughs> and you know, this is a 16 year old daughter in a Confucian society. She presumably has never kissed anyone. And her first kiss is going to be this monk, you know? <laughs> I mean, what? But yeah, there it is. That's how it goes. So yeah, um, right. Okay, we got time for one or two more comments or questions. And if you're not actually commenting, please um, mute yourself. So yeah. Okay. Yes, ma'am. Oh uh, no, I thought somebody was unmuting themselves, but they were just making sure they were muted. Any other comments, questions, anything? Yes. Okay. Uh, <laughs> we look at self mutilation with teens now, or younger people, yeah. where they take a razor and cut themselves. Yeah. And most of us have uh, various opinions about it, but we think that something is truly troubling that young person. Yes, something is. So why that can't be the case with the earlier uh, Christians or Buddhists that would uh, mutilate themselves is something that we could think about. That's a really good point. Um, yeah, in our culture, when people self-mutilate themselves it's from this great pain that they're feeling and it's the only way that they know to relieve that pain and uh so yes there is a problem and it needs to be dealt with um they need to they need to find ways to relieve their pain that do not involve this kind of behavior yeah that's right. And your question is correct. You know, just as we don't know the motivations for people becoming monastics, we don't know the motivations for someone sticking their finger in a fire. Although if you read Xu Yun's autobiography, it's called Empty Cloud is the name of it. I'll put it in the chat so you all see it. Um, it's in chat to everyone. So Empty Cloud, because that's his name. I think it's, is it Shuyun or Shunyun? I forget. Um, anyway, you can find it. Um, it's a wonderful, wonderful book. It's, it, he, he lived from the mid 19th century to the mid 20th century. And um, he went through all the changes of government in China. I mean, it's a fascinating book. He went through the, com you know, the communist revolution he survived that. Um, it's just a, a remarkable book. And he talks about, you know, him doing that. And you can decide for yourself whether you think, well, this was a troubled man who should have gotten help, or whether you can say, well, this was a great bodhisattva, or whether you could say, this is something I don't understand, but I honor him doing it. I respect, I respect him doing it, not honor, but I respect him doing it. You can decide for yourself. Um, but yeah, usually we don't, just as we don't know why somebody enters a monastery, we don't know why somebody did one of these practices. We don't know why these guys in um, northern Mexico and the, um, and the southeastern United States go around flagellating themselves on certain Christian holidays, Catholic holidays. You know, they don't tell us. They just do it. It's so much in their culture that I don't even think that they would think to analyze why they're doing it. So yeah, that's a really good question and a good point. Um, we have time for one more. Oh, I should send my message. There we go. I wanted There's, to ask one question about yeah. your comments about the Buddha at the beginning and his yeah. reluctance to accept women. And um, yeah. Ananda pointed yeah. out that women could be enlightened. But what what was the meaning? And what is your opinion of his, his statement about five hundred years? Not it would have been a thousand years. And so he felt it was what women were undermining or, or, or I don't know. I wasn't there. Right. Somehow I, what, what, what are, what's the scholarly opinion of that? 
I don't know that there can be scholarly opinion because nobody was there. You can make excuses. You can make reasons, but nobody was there. And there's no written record. Um, but it seems to me that, I mean, my feeling about it, and I mentioned this when I was talking about the eight special rules and then the extra, like a hundred or so extra precepts in Korea that uh, women take, uh, nuns take compared to monks, um, that what he was worried about was that Buddhism would be um, socially unacceptable, that it would be seen as challenging the social norms in such a way that it would not be able to thrive. That would be my theory, but it's only my theory. You know, you have a, a culture where women are, are kept in a certain place, and then when you allow them more autonomy, then you're challenging the social order. That was, you know, one of the major reasons that Confucianism, um, Confucius governments would tend to um, put down Buddhism was because Buddhism in many, many ways, not just gender, in many, many ways, challenged the social order and was seen as a, as a place of potential rebellion against the government. So he was worried, that's what I think, he was worried about challenging the social order because he seemed to be quite supportive of the women who actually, and then, you know, as the way the stories are told, he was quite supportive of the women who did become teachers, did become nuns, were um, important lay women. But like I said, there's, this is just an opinion and you can have whatever opinion you want. Um, I just found it troubling. Yeah, sure you know, it's troubling. He readily acknowledged women could be enlightened, though did he see it as a lesser type of enlightenment? Or I mean, it was, it didn't no, matter. no, that's that's very clear. That waking up, I hate that word enlightenment. Awakening is awakening, and it doesn't matter who has it. It doesn't matter if it's you know a Naga princess under the sea. You know, um, awakening is just awakening. There was this idea that only you had to inhabit a so you could prepare for awakening in a female body, but the final awakening had to be in a male body. So the Naga princess, she's seven years old, she's listening to the Buddha speak and she wakes up, but for a millisecond, she becomes a little boy. And that's when she wakes up, then she goes back to being a girl. <laughs> you know, that's okay. If you gotta, you know, do that. Um, so yeah. Um, but yeah, these, these are troubling issues. And if we, if we see Buddha and Buddhist, um, I don't know, teaching scriptures, whatever you want to say, um, as containing 100% wisdom, then your mind just sort of, you know, kind of contorts around like, how do you, how do you, you know, how do you take that in? But if you see it, it's just human beings. You know, it's just human beings and we're all human and we all know that we all make mistakes. And yeah, so maybe in that time and place what they did seem sort of reasonable. And then later we look and we say, are you kidding? That's completely ridiculous, you know? So the wonderful thing about Zen is it encourages us to be independent. It encourages us to not take things as gospel in the sense of one must believe in this thing. It takes, it, Buddha said, you know, check it out yourself. Don't believe me. Just check it out yourself. So someone else is unmuted. Do you want to say something? Yeah. Yeah. Um, I, I heard the story about the sexist story, the person telling the sexist story and your reaction to it reminds me of my brother who lives um, in Oklahoma going to church and all the people there don't wear masks because uh -huh. they don't want to. Um, and I tend to carry on about that, where I could just say, oh, they shouldn't, they shouldn't be doing that. They should be wearing masks and continue on rather than going into my histrionics about it, which my brother doesn't want to hear and I tend to do. So thank you. It doesn't help him either, does it? Uh, no, 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 no. Yeah, <laughs> that's the thing. When you do that, you, you know, people just sort of, you back them in a corner and then they're going to lash out. You're not going to convince anyone that way. It's an interesting issue. Yeah. It's really interesting. Yeah, I, I found myself saying to somebody the other day, you know, I almost never go to a store, but I was in some store and I was bringing my stuff to my car when people in the next car were bringing their stuff. And I looked at them and I said, you know, you really should be wearing a mask. And they just looked at me. So I left. 
<laughs> you know, yeah. Well, I want to thank everybody. Is, unless there's, does anybody have one more thing to say? If we have just a little time. Okay, so thank you, everybody. This was completely wonderful. I don't know if I was wonderful. You were wonderful. Thank you very much. And we can stop recording now. <laughs>